Because let there be no mistake about it. If a state is an apartheid Nazi state, you don't want to have a state like that in your midst. So these indictments of Israel as an apartheid Nazi state are not simply idle rhetoric. They carry with them, in effect, an obligation on the part of all of us to do something against this Nazi apartheid state and, in effect, to silence its supporters because its supporters are deemed to be co-conspirators in the support of a crime against humanity, e.g. Uh, Israel, because that's what apartheid is defined as in international law. And if you call it also a Nazi state, that means the dismantling of this state becomes morally obligatory because certainly we should not have a state embodying such uh, evil as part of the international community. Now notice, I am not speaking about critiques of Israel. Israel, like any other state, is responsible for any violations of human rights and humanitarian law. And the Jewish people are not entitled to any privilege or preference before the law because of the Holocaust or Jewish suffering. The problem is not, however, that anyone should seek to put Israel above the law. The problem is that Israel is being systematically denied equality before the law in the international arena. Not that human rights standards are applied to Israel, which they must be, but that these standards are not applied equally to everyone else, thereby creating a situation of discrimination in the international arena. In the same way that we would say in any of the countries that we live in, you should not have any minority, any visible minority, any Aboriginal people, any group singled out for differential or discriminatory treatment in any of our societies. And in fact, by domestic law, it would be prohibited. Similarly, in the international arena, you cannot have any state, in this instance, state X, Israel, that is singled out for differential and discriminatory treatment. What applies domestically applies also internationally. But it has gone even beyond simply, although that would be bad enough, the singling out of Israel for discriminatory and differential uh, treatment. I want to, at this point, make reference to a phenomenon that occurred recently in the Israel-Gaza conflict. And that is the inflammatory misuse of Holocaust comparisons to describe the conflict in Gaza, and I'm going to abbreviate my remarks here on this point for reasons of time, but to describe it in a dual demonizing indictment. And notice the nature of this dual demonizing indictment. Saw it again here in, outside the Palais des Nations. We've seen it in marches and demonstrations in different countries. We've seen it in remarks of la trahison des clercs, to use the words of Benda, <coughs> the treason of the elites repeating themselves again. On the one hand, Jews are blamed for perpetrating a Holocaust on the Palestinians. As the, in the appalling statement, and just in order to protect her, I won't mention her name, but the appalling statement recently of a Norwegian diplomat who said, and I quote, the grandchildren of Holocaust survivors from World War II are doing to the Palestinians exactly what was done to them by Nazi Germany. And on the other hand, and many of you have perhaps been witness to this, I certainly have, and even in my own country, crowds are incited to another Holocaust against the Jews, as in the chants of protesters who scream, quote, Hamas, Hamas, Jews to the Gaz. The point is that whatever one's perspective on the Gaza conflict, and as I said, critiques of Israeli policy and practice like critiques of any other state are legitimate. The comparison between Israel's action against Hamas, a terrorist group sworn by its own covenant and in its own words to the destruction of Israel, the comparison between that group and its intention to destroy Israel and the comparison between Israel perpetrating 
a Nazi Holocaust against the Palestinians is as false as it is obscene. I say this not as a proponent. I say this not as a proponent for Israel, but in the immediate aftermath of Holocaust commemoration that we commemorated here in Geneva, I say this as a voice for Holocaust remembrance. Drawing false parallels, and this needs to be said because there are too many of these false parallels that are being drawn. Drawing false parallels between the Gaza conflict and Nazi G Germany is an affront not only to the living Holocaust survivors and their children and gra grandchildren, but to the six million deceased. These men, women, and children did not die in any war or conflict. They perished in a deliberate eliminationist horror, which, as Elie Wiesel put it, not all victims were Jews, but all Jews were victims. And so I move on now to the third manifestation that is concerned Elie Wiesel, to which I made reference and will be very brief on this one. The third is the singling out of one member state in the international ar arena for discrimination and indictment. But when this is done, and this is the disturbing phenomenon, as I say, the singling out is disturbing enough, but when it is done under the protective cover of the United Nations, when it is done by invoking the imprimatur of international law, when it is done under the banner of the struggle for human rights, it adds the idiom of bigotry to the idiom of false indictments. I will give you one example. I could cite chapter and, and verse and burden you the rest of the day with this. But one example. The United Nations Council on Human Rights, which replaced its, as Kofi Annan said, discredited predecessor, United Nations Commission on Human Rights, which also engaged in this singling out of a member state. The United Nations Council on Human Rights, and I hear I speak as a law professor, and which I take seriously, because this is the repository of international law standard setting. This is to speak about the promotion and protection of human rights on behalf of all of us. This UN Council on Human Rights, since its inception in 2006, has adopted some 32 resolutions of condemnation. 26 of those resolutions, 26 of those resolutions singled out one member state in the international community. That one member state happens to be Israel. But the worst thing, and this leads me to the fourth and last manifestation, the worst thing is that the major human rights violators have enjoyed exculpatory immunity. Not one resolution of condemnation against Iran. Not one resolution of condemnation against Darfur. And I can go on. And so, what should disturb us, those of us, and I suspect that includes almost everyone in this room, that care about the integrity of the UN, that care about the authority of international law, that care about the struggle for human rights and the struggle against discrimination, should be concerned about what is being done in our name and what is not being done in our name. What I'd like to do at this point is close and lead into the panel now and the voices of the victims by giving you a case study of an encounter that I had as Minister of Justice and Attorney General of Canada with perhaps the most disenfranchised or, let us say, discriminated against a minority in, in Canada. I'm referring to the Aboriginal people. Shortly after I was appointed Minister of Justice and Attorney General of Canada, and I believe this encounter not only may tell us something about the last implication that I said of what is going on today, the need for moral leadership, it may lead us naturally into the next panel and to listening to the voices of the victims. 